Okay, I'm going to talk about Shaw's algorithm. Quick, very quick introduction, because this is only a 15-minute session. I'm James. Nice to meet you all. I work for ThoughtWorks. If you're interested in ThoughtWorks, look us up. And there's some books written by people from the ThoughtWorks community. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is show you a, a quick video. Uh, and then in order to do that, I need to do this. The three of us have been trying to reproduce the double slit experiment. So this is Ben, this is James, and I'm James as well. We've used equipment that you can find anywhere. Well, 3D printer maybe. Yeah. Wow. Down here, we made a frame and a holder for our double slit. We made the double slit by using a sharp knife in between some tin foil. Here we have a laser pointer. It's the same laser pointer that I'm going to be using during the presentation. So who knows, I might even reproduce it if I've got this equipment, but it'll probably end up in the bin later. Down this end, we've got 3D models of Ben. We've got Big Ben and medium sized Ben. Little Ben we left on the table over there somewhere. And they're holding our screen to receive the results. So let's see if we can make a diffraction, uh, an interference pattern at the other end of this desk. It's very scientifically done this, and I, there it is. Can we see the interference pattern? And that is quantum physics in action as demonstrated for you in the ThoughtWorks office. Thank you very much. Well, that's perfect for a second. Yeah, we get a really good shot of it. Okay, so why did I show you that? Well, what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk is essentially quantum computing. What does it mean? Uh, oh, that's not what meant to happen. Hang on, what's going on? Here we go. Um, Quantum computing, what's it all about? Well, the, uh, the reason why I'm showing this is essentially that um, that experiment was originally devised by a man called um, Young back in 1809, and he designed it as a way to demonstrate that light travelled in waves rather than as particles. And what that shows is because of the fact that it travels in waves, you get an interference pattern like you would get in standing waves in water. But then later on, somebody did a similar experiment with photons of light, by which time we, we thought that light travelled as particles called photons. And the interesting thing was, if you can do the experiment through a double slit onto a photon detector and you can transmit the photons exactly one at a time, you still get an interference pattern if you detect the photons in a photon detector. Now, what that means is that the photons are somehow interfering with something that isn't there. Now, depending on whether you... Uh, accept the many worlds interpretation or whatever else, you might accept that there are actually many photons traveling through many different worlds, many different universes, and that's how the interference pattern comes up. But it's inescapable the fact that a single photon has an interference pattern with something that you cannot see, you cannot observe. Why is that important? Well, because that is where the power of quantum computers come from. Now, specifically in quantum computers, I'm going to talk about very quickly, the elephant in the many quantum rooms. Anybody got any idea who these three gentlemen are? Go. Let's see. No. Good guess, though. Want to take a guess at these two? Diffie and Hellman. This is Diffie and Hellman. And I'm going to come back to you. Do you know who these three guys are? Oop, point at the computer. They are Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. Why are we talking about them? Because we're going to talk about cryptography. Essentially, cryptography is based on the fact that you find something that's easy to do in one direction and hard to do in the other direction. And most cryptography algorithms rely on the fact that it's easy to multiply two numbers together, but it's difficult to work out what the two factors of any given number are. So, what is Shaw's algorithm? Well, Shaw's algorithm is a way of factorizing large numbers. The way it works is, say I'm trying to factorize 15, I pick a number less than 15 at random. Seems an odd way to start, but that's how it works. Then, uh, if that doesn't happen to be a factor, so let's say I choose two, what, we, what we're interested in is finding the period of that number with respect to 15. So two squared is four, uh, two to the three is eight, 2 to the 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 15. So 2 has a periodicity of 4. It goes 2, 4, 8, 
one, two, four, eight, one, two. So it has a periodicity of four. Why is that important? Because simple algebra will tell us that at step six, that what that means is two squared plus one and two squared minus one will yield the factors of 15. And we can easily see that, right? Because two squared plus one is five, two squared minus one is three. And there it is in place. So that's the example there. That's a simple example of how to factorize 15. You don't just search all the factors. So this is the most efficient way to factorize it. I'm going to show you something that illustrates how complex this algorithm still is. So, um, oh God, I need to do that thing on the display again, don't I? Here we go. So, I wanted to understand how Shure algorithm really works. So I made a spreadsheet. I was attempting to factorize 1,517, which is not a massive number. What I was trying to do, and you can see in here, is that clear to everybody? Let's make that a little bit bigger. Oh, God, Command Plus should do that, shouldn't it? Oh, it's not working. Oh, there you go. So what I've done there is I've raised 16 to successive powers to see what its periodicity with respect to 1,517 is. Now, if we scroll down, we can see that the periodicity is 45 of 16. Now, that doesn't help us because it's not an even number. So then I tried 5, and I found that the factor was, the periodicity was, there it is, 180. So what that tells us is 5 to the power 90 plus 1 and 5 to the power 90 minus 1 will give us the two factors of 1,517. Unfortunately, that didn't help me because we see that it overflows at 5 to the power 22. So no good for me because I wanted exact integers. So I searched all day that, that morning on the way in on the train, and I discovered that 14 has a periodicity of 24. And crucially, 14 to the power 12 does not overflow. OK? Now, the interesting thing about all these workings is you can see how complex these calculations are. This is just to calculate the factors of 1,517. Um, but Shaw's algorithm doesn't need to know all of these intermediate results. It doesn't care that 14 to the power 8 is that number beginning with 147, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't care about that. All it cares about is the periodicity of the function. And there's something which, thankfully, I don't have time to explain here called the quantum Fourier transform, which enables you to understand the periodicity of functions without evaluating all its values. And that's where the power of Shaw's algorithm comes in, because we don't care about these intermediate numbers. All we care about is this number here, this 24. So Shaw's algorithm relies on the fact that you can find the period of something without evaluating it at every level. So what does that mean? Let's have a look. Uh, I need to go back to my thing. Here we go. So there you go, step number four. That's the quantum magic. Use the quantum period finding routine to find the period of the number. And that relies, as I say, on something called the um, quantum Fourier transform, which in turn relies on the fact that you see interference between the qubits in a quantum computer. As I say, I don't have time to fully examine that, but if you watch one of my other talks, I do explain it a bit more. And that is the key, because step number four has exponential complexity on a classical computer. On a quantum computer, it has uh, polynomial complexity. So if you try to evaluate Shor's algorithm, uh, if you try to run Shor's algorithm on a classical computer, if you, have, if you construct a 2048-bit key, an RSA key, it will take the biggest theoretical quantum... Uh, if you used every electron in the universe as a bit in a theoretical classical computer, it would take longer than the lifetime of the universe to factorize a 3072-bit key. So that's how strong encryption is against a classical computer. But if you can build a quantum computer big enough, you will break encryption. This illustrates a little bit better how complex it is. I wrote an algorithm, which you can get off my GitHub there, that calculates Shor's algorithm. And I ran it. Uh, this was when I was in Ukraine last year. Uh, I ran it. And it took like 10 minutes, and then my computer crashed. And then I ran it again, and it took 10 minutes, my computer crashed. Eventually, I managed to get it to work. I screen grabbed it and thought, right, well, I'll, I'll show this in the presentation because I don't have time to run it. Uh, I spoke to a ThoughtWorks colleague, and I asked him to evaluate um, 
uh, to, to re-implement Shaw's algorithm from first principles because I didn't like the Microsoft implementation of the quantum Fourier transform. And if you look on Andrew's GitHub, his implementation is way better than mine. And this is what he messaged me when I was on the train on the way home from Manchester. One and a half hours to factorize 35. So, apparently it's a long way off. So, do we care? Is RSA under threat? Well, Shaw's algorithm needs uh, twice as many qubits. A qubit is, is a bit like a bit, but in a quantum computer. You need twice as many qubits as the size of the key in order to implement Shaw's algorithm because of the quantum Fourier transform. So, if you want to factorize a 1,024-bit number, you need about 2,000 qubits. So, oh, I'm, I'm saying three times the size. Oh, yeah, it should say three times the size. I apologize for that. That's factually incorrect. So, uh, yeah, factorizing a 2048-bit key, which I understand is what is currently in play. Most RSA algorithms and, and elliptic curves are relying on 2048-bit keys at the moment. Uh, so you'd need a 6,000-qubit computer. That's quite a long way off. Um, the largest known computer, or at least when I first did this slide a few months ago, was 72 qubits, which is a computer owned by a company called um, uh, Rigetti in, in California. Um, that's the largest computer anybody knows about. So, when they get big enough, RSA will be useless. That's a fact. So, what do, what do we have to do to prepare for RSA being useless? Well, there is an encryption algorithm called BB84, that's Bennett and Brassard, which relies on the polarization of uh, photons to create a unique key for the message, and it is provably secure because you, you use these photons to generate a one-time key, effectively. It's like exchanging a one-time keypad. That algorithm is 100% secure. There are other classical computing algorithms that are in existence right now that we should be using, such as there's something called lattice-based encryption, uh, there's something called super-singular elliptic curve, and there's something called symmetric key quantum resistance, so I don't know what that means. Um, According to my colleague Andrew that I mentioned on a slide earlier, because he studied this stuff at university, essentially the difference between these algorithms and RSA is that these algorithms rely on an array of large numbers, whereas RSA relies on a single large number. So we can use these right now, but as far as I know, nobody does. We should be using these in our browsers right now. Um, as far as I know, the reason why we're not doing them is because there's a performance penalty. If you're going to be encrypting against one of these algorithms rather than RSA, there's a performance penalty. So um, something called Open Quantum Safe, you can browse to it, um, talks about um, that's a movement that's been going for a couple of years, which is basically trying to get us all to take on post-quantum cryptography. So I'm going to return to this now. You remember right at the start, nobody knew who these three chaps were. So here's a quick history lesson. Diffie and Hillman published their paper in 1976. This was the first example, or the first publicly known example, of um, public key exchange. This was where they described how to do public key exchange. Um, shortly after that, RSA came along, 1977. Okay, so far so good. What's the problem? Well, these three chaps here that I'm sort of standing in the way of. In 1997, the British government released the fact that these three men who worked for GCHH, GCHQ in, in the UK, they had an RSA algorithm. They had devised the RSA algorithm years before Rives, Shemir, and Edelman did. And of course, our secret services at the time didn't tell us that. They told us 20 years later when it comes to the official secrets. So why is that significant? Well, right now, all of the secret services all over the world are harvesting all of your RSA traffic and storing it. Right? It doesn't matter that they can't read it right now because one day they will have quantum computers and they are not going to tell us about it. Think about what that means and think about why we should be scared of Shaw's algorithm. And I leave you with that thought. Thank you. <laughs>